So look, guys, thank you again, as Zoom said. Th thanks for coming along today. We have now 50 people on, on, on board, which is great. It's uh, roughly half the people who, who, who indicated that they'd come along. And what I wanted to do is kind of set the scene. And by setting the scene, the first thing I wanted to say was, and make an admission, uh, or a confession at least, that I'm a junkie. Not that type of junkie, I'm more a news junkie. And probably like a lot of you, I've kind of been obsessed over the last couple of weeks with the amount of news, largely negative news, that's kind of dominated the news agenda. Now, I grew up um, maybe not unlike a lot of you uh, in the 70s. And when I think back on that time, the typical Irish family's news diet was kind of dictated by the eight o'clock news uh, in the morning time, the lunchtime news, the six o'clock news and the nine o'clock news. But to be honest, a large part of that news was quite finite. It was to the point, it was limited, uh, maybe lacking huge engagement because you didn't have the amount of video content and so on that we now take for granted, I suppose, as part of our news diet. And that was back in the 70s, not the 1870s, but the 1970s. And that's that's when I grew up. Now, as we all know, we have rolling news 24-7 across radio and TV and digital and mobile and phone alerts and everything else. So we're bombarded with news and we know at the moment that the news agenda is particularly awful. Uh, and God knows the narrative is really, really awful. And it's kind of leading to a large dose of anxiety amongst people. And, you know, you only have to, to look at the, the kind of daily news bulletins or hear them on the radio or whatever. And we're hearing all the kind of same fra phrases being used over and over again by, by people. Clearly, the war in Ukraine, dreadful situation, the floods in Pakistan, the climate crisis, our own crises around things like housing and childcare uh, and cost of living and so on. And then, as I say, phrases like greedflation, uh, energy poverty, price gouging, rip off republic, they've just become part of the general narrative that's, as I say, causing a huge amount of anxiety for people. And I think particularly for people who are freelancing, people who are working on their own for the large part, and people who depend on, I suppose, a much more positive climate for their services to, to be engaged by clients and, and, and by agencies as well. So what we wanted to try and do today, kicking off the session, was trying to put some of that, if you like, recessionary hysteria, hysteria at least, into some form of balance. So what I did here was I, I took a sample of two days of the Irish Times back in August, not too far back in August, because literally every day there's a bit of positive news. And I'm not talking about the happy clappy stuff because, you know, we're not saying today everything is great. No need, nothing to see here. Move on. We know people are under pressure and that pressure is going to increase. But there it needs to be a bit of balance and a bit of perspective brought to the debate as well. And as I say, these are a couple of headlines that I've taken from the Times so despite the worst cost of living crisis that we seem to be in for a decade, the Irish economy continues to grow. And certainly all the indicators that we have so far, if you believe the central bank, is that the economy is going to grow by 9%, despite all of the things that are happening at the moment. And that's a brilliant place for any economy, certainly in the Western world, to be in. I think we're the exception, um, which, which, as I say, puts us in a different place. Doesn't mean everything is great, um, but certainly it puts us in a better place than a lot of other markets. Employment, as the, the, the cutting there suggests, is at a historic high. We know exports, exports are booming. We know that the government looks set to return a surplus in the budget this year way sooner than anybody would have expected. I mean, who would have thought it 18 months ago that we'd back, be back to not just pre-pandemic levels, but ahead of those pandemic levels as well. We know that businesses, if you're outside of the, if you like venture capital funded tech sector, most businesses are still hiring people. And we know there are some layoffs, but they're not that prevalent. They're almost, again, the exception uh, rather than the rule at the moment. So I'm just gonna let a few more people in who just, uh, just arrived. So we are not in a recession. So we really wanted to nail that from, from, from the outset. We're not in a recession at the moment. Let's not forget what a recession actually looks like. It means big cuts in employment. It means big falls in things like house prices, which are clearly not happening at the moment. It means people in negative equity, and it means the government doing austerity, which they are not on the, on the uh, certainly at that level, at, at a, and at, by any stretch of the imagination, in fact, the exception. 
uh, because we're expecting a really benevolent budget in the next couple of weeks. So we're not seeing any of the typical signs of a recession prevalent in the Irish market at the moment. Now, as I say, that's not to say everything is rosy in the garden. We know it's not. And clearly the, the, the downturn, if you like, and the pressure is going to affect different people in different ways. So I suppose the thing that we would say is that any recession or any downturn is not equalized. Um, let me just again let in a few more people here. So the downturn will not be equalized. And we know that, you know, there are certain households, uh, lower income households are going to be more direct, directly affected by the squeeze that's going to happen, clearly with energy prices over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the Again, going back to the, to the central bank, the expectation is that real income for most people will decline by about 3% by the year end. Now, it could be a little bit more than that, but 3% uh, is the, the predicted level. But clearly, there are certain households, poorer households, people on, on lower wages will be more dramatically affected than that. So as I say, it's not to say nothing to see here, no need to worry. We know that, that people will, will suffer pain over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, the business that we're all in, the business of marketing, and again, the mood music, for those of you who keep an eye on the trade press or the business press generally, the mood music generally is not great around marketing or the marketing world at the moment. And again, just to take a couple of the global headlines, uh, the whole area of digital ad spending, which is the part of the business that was kind of keeping a lot of boats afloat. We know that the, the tech platforms, you know, the Meta and Google and so on, they're still growing, their income is still coming in, but maybe not growing to the same extent. So it's not as boomy as it used to be in that kind of tech ad space uh, as before. We also know that looking at the growth numbers around online retail sales, that there was an expectation that they would exceed in a lot of sectors, the uh, bricks and mortar retail sales, and that hasn't happened either. So a lot of businesses are still dependent on good old fashioned stores to generate most of their business. It's not to say that online isn't growing, it is, uh, but it's been put in its place. And we keep hearing that the agency model is broken. And look, up to a point, maybe it is, and parts of it are, uh, no doubt about that. But again, from our conversations and from the briefs that we've received over the last couple of months and the last couple of weeks from agencies, it seems almost every agency is busy at the moment. So whether they're pitching for new business, pitching to hold on to existing business, getting new campaigns up and running, work is definitely at a level that is, again, at pre pandemic levels. Um, so, you know, there is a demand for talent. And the last point there, and you can see it on the bottom right of the chart, clients are under a huge amount of pressure. So despite, again, recessionary or potential recessionary times, every CMO is still briefed to deliver revenue growth. And what that means is that they'll put pressure back on their agencies or their marketing departments, and ultimately on people like yourselves to get work done and that's why we think that this time for freelancing is actually a really great opportunity opportunity for real professional freelancers to do well. Una, do you want to take it up from there? Yeah. So uh, if you just move ahead on the old slide there, Peter. Yeah, sorry, I'm just letting a few people in and uh, move the slides on. Yeah. Yeah, so look, in the context of all of what Peter has just outlined, and regardless of really what happens over the next number of months, clients and agencies are still going to need to get work done. And this is great news for freelancers. Um, what we are hearing about is sort of recruitment freezes on permanent hires and discrete layoffs in agencies, particularly with the networked agencies who are being, um, you know, instructed by New York or London on where to cut costs. Um, but we're not seeing corresponding reduction in workloads and, and demand for individuals, quite the opposite. Um, layoffs and cost cutting is mainly about fixed cost reduction. And the great news, again, for freelancers is that, you know, freelancers are not part of fixed costs. So many companies and agencies will continue to hire freelancers to fill a gap in their team. So uh, if you just move on there, Peter. Sure. Um, 
So when all of this is happening, this is when freelancing should thrive. Uh, cash is still going to be flowing in the economy and companies are still going to need to have access to uh, to freelancers. And when, you know, and at the Indie List, we're all about professional freelancers at the top of their game, people who go in, add value, are great to work with, do it really well, do it consistently and leave the client looking for more. Um, and I think the other thing and the final thing maybe to say about the economic climate that we're operating in right now is that many freelancers, particularly those who've been working for themselves for some time, have been through this before. They've been through boom and bust. They've survived the challenging environment that COVID brought to us and they have developed a sort of a muscle memory on how to hustle and this will only serve them well. So I just want to chat to you about the roles that you know we see a very big demand for. We've been in business now for over two years and we have almost 1100 people uh, signed up in our community. Um, some of the roles where there has been very high demand you know won't be a big surprise to you and they've been in demand since we kind of virtually opened our doors two years ago and other roles um, there's been a kind of a fluctuation at the start there wasn't a massive demand for them right now there's a huge demand for them so I'll talk you through that in a second um, so look we in our community of 1100 people um, we've got about 25 percent of the total community are creative so you know art directors graphic designers copywriters another 12 25 percent are the production and craft end of the creative services so illustrators animators producers and so on uh, about uh, 40 percent are digital so this probably won't be massively surprising to many of you here and that is everything from web development to e-commerce ux ui seo content etc and then the final 10 percent is made up of people who have worked at a very senior level in agency or in 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 industry and they work as comms planners brand planners marketing consultants project managers and account handlers and we see a massive demand for those roles and um, they tend to operate at a very high level um, certainly in terms of the brand planners and the marketing consultants they are operating at the c-suite um, they are uh, typically going into um, agencies or directly into clients for longer periods of time they might go in for three to four months or even longer if they're in to cover a leave contract um, or go in to manage a particularly chunky piece of work from start to finish. Client service managers and project managers also tend to kind of go in for longer periods of time, typically to cover mat leave cover or where there's a particular um, increase in volume of work at a given time. They tend to be more mid-level than more senior. They're essentially the people who kind of keep the show on the road. Um, from a digital perspective huge demand in this area so much so that sometimes we can't fill the demand within our own community and and we've we've had to start kind of hustling and looking for freelancers outside of Ireland to join to join the indie list um, but these are people who work as digital marketing managers there are people who kind of are very very comfortable in both strategy but can also roll their sleeves up and do implementation and are very much all about measurement evaluation performance reporting and so on which is a really really important part of the op of our operating environment and actually the better we can get at performance and measurement and evaluation the more we're going to be able to continue to make the business case for marketing and strengthen our position in the time of a downturn or a recession um, search and social uh, specialists, massively important role and function in a client's marketing function and team um, and uh, very much sought after individuals. And then um, from a web design, a UX and UI perspective, as more and more people are communicating and transacting online, the need for a more improved user experience has never been greater. 
Um, in relation to the creative roles that we see massive demand for, when we started off, first of all, we actually didn't see a huge demand for your traditional pairing of art director and copywriter. Um, this was probably because a lot of the agencies operating in this market had their own kind of bank of freelancers, their go to people who they would approach for different um, bits, uh, different projects and uh, different um, requirements. Uh, but because demand has been really, really high, we have seen an increase increase in demand for these roles and it's absolutely fantastic to be able to kind of see that and to be able to put really good people into roles where they're excellent at ideation excellent at concepts but also are really comfortable about rolling out across all of the communications channels paid and and owned um Another area where we constantly see a very, very high demand um, is in the in the uh, role of a specialist writer. So what we're talking about there are people who are really comfortable with long form writing for web, um, writers for blogs, white writers for white yeah. papers, case studies and thought leadership pieces, and also specialist B2B writers who can take very kind of dense information, be it from the pharma sector, agri, tech, financial services, and take that copy and translate it into copy that is much more user friendly. Um, we're seeing huge demand for those people and delighted to see so many of them on the call today. Thanks. And, um, I know the, the other area of, of real interest to, to people today, because we got the feedback when we sent out the notice, was on the whole area of rates. Um, and I'm going to talk about the average rates that we're seeing at the moment. Um, there's a few caveats before I show you some of the numbers here. Um, their average rate, average day rates across primary, the primary category. So again, those three areas that Una has outlined, the digital area, client facing roles, but also the creative roles themselves as well. Um, they represent what freelancers are ideally looking for, if you like, uh, but may not be getting in every case. So the ideal that people start off with, and we can completely understand that, it's up to everybody to set their own individual rates. They are averages. Uh, again, I have to stress that some individuals charge much more than what you'll see here, and that's great. And some individuals are charging a lot less. Um, but it is very much based on expertise. It's based on experience and it's based on scarcity. So for certain types of roles, again, particularly in the digital area, uh, there are just not enough people. And as a result of that, the rates that people can command are a, a, a lot higher than might be the case in uh, versus other roles. The rates we know have also increased over the last couple of months, and that's natural as well uh, because of the demand for, for people. But we also know, based on conversations with agencies, particularly uh, in the last couple of weeks, that they will come under pressure because agencies naturally are under pressure as well. And I think sometimes uh, the things that, that maybe we're guilty of is that, you know, clearly agencies have to make their own margin on top of a freelance rate as well. So, you know, expecting to get what you maybe have previously got working as an employee of an agency won't necessarily uh, apply in the case of, of uh, you know, working in a freelance capacity. So again, you need to factor that in. So look, they're, they're the kind of caveats, if you like, before looking at the rates themselves. And again, we've broken them into, into the three areas. So let me look, first of all, at the client facing roles. Um, the C-suite marketing consultants. So these people tend to be employed directly by, by clients themselves. So they're brought in to you know, work out a marketing strategy for a company who may not have that capability to do so themselves. Uh, it might be bringing an existing market, market, market or go-to market strategy alive uh, and pulling in people as they need them as a result of that. And those type of people are generally commanding anywhere between 800 and 1500 euros a day. Uh, the senior comms planners or agency planners, again, a scarce breed on the indie list. I think we have probably about eight uh, current, currently active. Uh, a lot of them have picked up full-time work, but those people generally in or around 700 to 900 euros a day. Client service roles, whether they're project management or working on advertising, uh, communications campaigns for PR agencies, working as part of kind of planning agencies and so on. Senior client service roles on average are somewhere around 500 to 600 euros a day. And again, in some cases, a lot higher than that. Uh, the areas where most agencies are under pressure, again, because of 
you know, the erosion of staff levels, particularly at, at a mid-level within an agency, uh, that's where there's huge demand right across the board is what we're seeing. So 400 to 500 euros a day typically is what a mid-level client service freelancer can charge. And digital project management similarly tends to be more on the client side, but people who are capable of structuring a digital campaign, not necessarily implementing it, but managing all of the component parts of a digital uh, project. So whether that's a web develop development project or a large kind of social or search campaign uh, are commanding somewhere around 500 to 600 euros uh, per day. Let me move on to the digital roles themselves. So social media strategists, um, again, people who are kind of setting the agenda in terms of social media usage, usually around organic social as opposed, uh, as opposed to paid social, four, 400 to 500 euros a day. Um, at the other end, you have people who are there to manage social community posts and so on. Um, sorry, I just need to let a few more people into the room. Um, they are commanding at a low level, probably 250 euros a day to up to 350 euros a day. And again, that's maybe responding to consumers who are communicating with companies through Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be. The area that we're seeing increasing demand, and I think it will continue over the next couple of months as clients really focus on performance-led uh, investment in digital is the area of search. So whether that's organic search or PPC, uh, there's a number of, of, of roles that we're trying to fill at the moment. And typically it's around 450 to 550 a day, depending on, on the level of expertise that an individual can offer. Uh, web designers, again, at the, uh, the top end on a daily basis, probably around 500 euros. Uh, for stuff that, that's generally more work a day, tends to be around a 350, 400 euros mark. And also a skill set that we've seen increasingly come to the fore is that appreciation for really good UX and U UI design as well. Uh, and again, somewhere around 400 to 600 euros uh, is, is, are the typical rates that people are looking for. Um, let me move on to the creative roles. And apologies, first of all, this chart is a little bit more complicated, but at one end you have executive creative directors. So these are people who might be brought in very senior level for maybe pitches or to, I suppose, manage a very large team within a creative agency. Um, typically 800 to 1,000 euros a day is what, what has been looked for and in some cases being paid as well for that type of individual. A standard creative director, probably more around a kind of 700 euro mark, uh, which is the next box up. And then you have copywriter, art director with maybe 10 years plus experience, the type of race that people are looking for, and in some cases maybe getting, but maybe not universally, uh, are around sort of 500 to 600 euros. And that same rate tends to apply for senior, senior graphic designers. So this is where people are charged with ideation as opposed to just rolling out an existing piece of, of, uh, of conceptual work. In the case of copywriters and art directors, maybe with lesser experience, where the work tends to be more of a rollout nature, uh, it's in or around 400 to 500 euros a day. And specialist B2B writers, so people, again, that Una has spoken about, who are really good at translating pretty technical, complicated copy into something that's understandable to the typical kind of web user, uh, again, commanding around 400 to 500 euros. Graphic designers, again, around kind of more implementational type work, 300 to 400 euros. And then web copywriters, more at that kind of blog end of things where people want regular pieces of, of work updated for posting on their website or posting on social media. Again, somewhere around 250 to 400 euros. So hopefully that gives you a sense, as I say, not standard across the board, typical rates that people are looking for, maybe not getting in every case. And we would say, look, it's great to quote day rates, um, but what sometimes happens with day rates, when we quote them with clients, we feel that sometimes it ends up commoditizing what freelancers are offering. And again, I'll, I'll say a couple of words about this in a couple of minutes when we talk about pricing itself. So day rates are great up to a point, but clearly people want to get beyond that and want to be able to justify the rates that they're charging. So as I say, I'll come back to that in a second. So we've talked about the roles that, that we believe are going to be in great demand. We've talked about the average prices. We've said that we're not in a recession. We're certainly not in a recession yet and hopefully won't be. Uh, so on the face of it, everything is grand or so it, say, so, so it seems the indie list people are saying, but we're not saying that at all because in order to 
put yourself in danger of getting work or continuing to get work over the next couple of months, we believe a fair degree of preparation needs to be put in place and it needs to be put in place now. So what we try to do is to determine what are the things that we see that freelancers, whether you're new to the game or you've been at it for some time, need to put in place. Because, look, ultimately, it's all about preparation. And that phrase that's been used so many times, it's a cliche. I don't know whether it was Roy Keane or some other brilliant philosopher who came up with it. Uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And it's absolutely true because it is a cliche. <laughs> Uh, that people do need to put in that kind of hard yards around the preparation and look at the things that maybe you've taken for granted around your pricing and your positioning and everything else. So I'm going to ask Una maybe to kick off with number one, which is about your personal brand. Yeah, well, uh, I'll just um, start this off by saying instead of fail to prepare, prepare to fail, we can use the the, the seven P's. Um, prior preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. So let's let's start there. But just actually before we jump into this, can I just sort of suggest that um, you know for for we've got 1,100 people now in our community. Um, we've got a great piece of software that allows people to fill out a really really smart profile. And Amanda's doing great work in terms of helping people get get their profiles really ship shape but it is ultimately everybody's individual responsibility to make sure that the information in there is correct so make sure that you're happy with the rate that you have in there because that's all that we are going on is the rate that you put into your profile um so in terms of what things you need to do to be match fit the first thing that we will always say is that you need to review your personal freelance brand to create awareness and distinctiveness now the irony here is that you know we work in an industry where we help customers build their own brands and yet when we turn the lens back in on ourselves it's kind of difficult you kind of go oh I don't really want to be talking about myself but it actually isn't as hard as we might think it is uh, when you work for yourself the most important thing you have is your reputation in other words it's what other people say about you um, and that's always the starting point we believe um, understanding this will really help you to rezone in on the positives about you as a as a professional and also address any negatives that might exist out there. Um, we believe that your personal brand needs to be rooted in your own individual and distinctive point of view. And when you have that point of view, then you have to start to communicate it. And when you start communicating it, this is what companies will see and hear about you and what they will remember about you. Um, so we would be saying write articles, participate in podcasts or webinars, uh, take time to really consider and diligently express your point of view and your thoughts on a particular topic of relevance. And building brand you, we kind of think there's sort of five um, five key steps in doing this. The first is about refining your CV and your portfolio, making sure that it's up to date, making sure that it's available, make sure that it's up on your platform, on your profile, on our platform. Um, make sure it's up to date with relevant work, recent work and uh, the type of uh, the clients that you've worked with, um, not just the work that you've done for them, but if possible, the results that you have achieved for and on behalf of your clients. Um, the second thing to do is to gather testimonials and case studies. Now, this is a fantastic way to re-engage with former clients and let them know that you're still available for work. Um, also, asking people to talk really nicely about you is a great way to engage in a bit of positive affirmation, and that never goes astray. Um, as we said at the beginning, um, create your own website. When you work for yourself, you can't just re rely on um, a sense that you are known within this marketplace. People are moving along all the time. People are um, new people coming into the market, new freelancers signing up all the time from outside of Ireland. Um, we know that the majority of people who get work through the Indie List have their own website. Yet over 50% of our community 
do not have a website. So that is, you know, you do the maths there. That is a kind of a stark realization. That's why we're putting on this session with Chris on the 13th of September. That's why we are constantly saying to you, please, please, please get your website up to date. It is not all that difficult. Um, and by the way, we're not just talking about creatives here. We think that anybody who works in our industry and who is self-employed needs to have their own website. Um, when you have developed your point of view, when you have developed your personal brand, then you start thinking about how am I going to broadcast this? Where am I going to show up and bring it to life? And that will sort of make you decide, right, what do I need to say and where? And then once you start, once you start that, you've got to really commit to it and show up all the time to build up awareness of who you are and what you represent and what you stand for. Um, we think at a very minimum, getting all over LinkedIn ha is just a no brainer. Um, we it has been an absolute game changer for us at the Indie List in terms of uh, gathering um gathering followers but also promoting what we do and what we stand for peter yeah the second part of it i mean i've, I've talked about the rates already but i think there is a need for everybody to start looking at the rates and that's not to say you need to reduce your rates it's absolutely the opposite it's to put some context around the rates that you're charging or ideally you want to get and we had a really interesting session as zuna mentioned uh, last year with sarah duran and sarah has produced some brilliant work in, in this particular area. I mean, she talked about at that session last year, for those of you who are involved, I'm not going to, you can see all these charts, by the way, later on, I meant to say that to you, so you don't need to take loads of notes, but you need to look at your kind of billable time. Um, so looking exactly at the, the type of ways in which you want to earn as a freelancer, how often you want to work in a typical week or a typical month, what you can do, because we all have kind of varied skill sets, there are things that we can do and there's stuff that we love, love to do and other, other stuff that we don't love to do. Uh, there's also the clients that you want to work for. There's certain types of clients that we really all love working for. And then there's others who are there to help us pay the bills. And again, it's kind of making sure that you're pricing yourself in a way that's attractive to that kind of broad range of, of, of clients and, and, and roles as well. Um, the other part of it is the non-billable time. And again, Sarah talked about this, that it's sometimes the kind of forgotten part of the equation of being a freelancer. There's a lot of time that people need to put in as part of that thing of building their business as a freelancer. So there's the, clearly the, the marketing of yourself, and Nuna has talked about that. There's the whole admin side and the financial side of it. And then there's the skill building thing, and we'll come on to that in a second. Um, you know, making sure that your skills are fit for purpose in the types of demands that both agencies and clients now expect uh, because things don't stay the same. And even if you are, you know, a graphic designer or a web designer or whatever, there are so many new developments, as we all know, that have taken place where skills need to be to, to be brought up to speed. And clearly, then, there's the whole area of sale, sales. So you might be busy at the moment, but where is the next job going to come from in a month's time? So keeping that pipeline, as we keep being told, uh, full uh, or at least relatively full. There's also more, much more creative ways, I think, to look at pricing. And again, we've talked about these on various sessions over the course of the last 18 months. You know, the, the problem with day rates is that they end up, as I said earlier, of people getting commoditized, that it's your high rate versus somebody's lower rate. And in a lot of cases, particularly direct clients, in our experience, they don't fully understand. So they end up going into a situation where I'll take him or her because she's charging 300 versus this individual is charging 500. And it's only when you put the context around the value that you're going to get for that, those individual freelancers that clients begin to appreciate that sometimes it's better hiring the more expensive individual. So the things that we say to clients and freelancers is that try to price on the basis of the scope of work. So don't just go in on the basis of, of here's my day rate, take it or leave it, uh, and off you go try to get an understanding as to what the output is at the other end and price accordingly. Productizing your services, it sounds it sounds almost again back into the commodity area, but what we're seeing more and more is that the really clever freelancers are beginning to put a menu of services together so that clients get a really good understanding as to what they're going to get based on the input from the particular freelancer. So that is all about 
putting a menu of services together so that clients can clearly see that. And related to that is value-based pricing. And when we've seen more and more, sorry, we've seen examples of people over the last two years putting together very basic kind of pitch documents where they say, you know, web design, 3,000 euro. And the, again, the clients just get into, well, there's a guy who's charging 1,500. I'll go with him or her. Uh, and so value-based pricing is really all about itemizing the elements that go into a particular project. So, you know, clearly in the case of web design, there are so many different elements that are maybe not seen or visible by a client. You know, all the pre-prep, the, the scoping out, the competitive set that people are going to be competing against, uh, the wireframing, the different concepts. So itemize all of those so that clients get a really clear picture as to what they're going to get as part of that total or that larger price. Anchor pricing maybe is something that you're not familiar with, but probably most of you are because we all see it every day when you go on to shop online, particularly for services, there's the gold, silver and bronze option. And that's really all about anchor pricing. So the basic price, or if you like, the bronze price tends to be the safe option. It's the, the one that clients ideally want to spend the least amount on. There's the bold price, which might be the gold or the premium one. And that's the one ideally you want to get clients towards. And then there's the anchor price, which tends to be the one in the middle. And again, we really encourage people, if they're getting into productizing their services or doing value-based pricing, that they give people a really good sense of the ways in which it could go. The value added bits are the bits that they'll get that will get them to a point where they're reasonably happy, but it's above what the minimum level might be, if all of that makes sense. And the final point is around long-term versus short-term rates. Again, I think most of you who've dealt with us over the last two years appreciate the value of slightly reducing your rate to get a longer extension uh, of, the, of the particular job. We found it in the last couple of days Somebody was asked uh, to extend maybe to go to three days instead of two and a half days. And it made much more sense for the individual to slightly drop the rate for a guarantee of three days a week over a course of a couple of months rather than two and a half days. And half a day is kind of hard to do for, for a freelancer to, to bracket off um, because you're left with a kind of a stray half day. So sometimes it's better to slightly reduce your price for a guarantee of work or, over the longer term. So there's all sorts of tricks as say we can you you can do around your pricing that doesn't commoditize you. Luna, do you want to talk about uh, buddying up? Yeah. Yeah, just to flash on. Yeah. So look, we we have always known um and uh that buddying up with complementary freelancers is a great way for all boats to rise, so to speak. Um, one of our first speakers was a guy called John Younger, who's kind of globally known as the freelance whisperer. And he used to always say hunting packs. So obviously, you know, this is, you know, uh, something that will be very familiar to a lot of people who are working as freelancers, whether they're kind of writers teaming up with art directors or writers teaming up with graphic designers. But we would also recommend that producers link up with uh, creative teams, planners hook up with um, digital strategists. I mean, look, I think the thing is that we're being asked more and more to assemble uh, teams, particularly for um, companies that don't necessarily have an advertising agency, don't need an advertising agency, but seriously need marketing input. And it's a great way for us to be able to move quickly is if people are familiar with working with each other and have preferred people that they like to partner up with. Do tell us when that is the case, because we'd love to be able to assemble a team um, for uh, based on your own preferences. We, we've talked about this one for, uh, again, a while, probably a bit like broken records about the website as well. Um, really set aside some time if you can. Um, the autumn is a time where people have tend to do nighttime courses and so on. But look, as a freelancer, it really is important that you continue to upscale, even in a kind of moderate way. It doesn't have to be hours and hours of a week. There are so many different sources, both online and offline, to which you can up upgrade particular types of skills. And we've we've a couple of a couple of them here. Most of you are familiar with with most of these, but LinkedIn Learning, for instance, there's free courses, 320 free courses up there over 800 hours. There's another source that we've seen, and again, some really interesting site or interesting courses up there covering personal development to business skills to coding and so on, and they're all completely free. 
Uh, the one that we have a relationship with is Contracting Plus, so really interesting organization who provide a lot of financial advice and accountancy advice to freelancers. But as part of that membership, that special deal that we have on your behalf with them, you have access to a whole range of really, really good uh, skills and personal development courses as part of that. So again, lots of really interesting sources there that uh, we'd encourage you to get involved in. Um, one other thing that we would really recommend is you get um, our, get a good accountant. We're so lucky that we work with a great guy who's here on the call, Shane Dolan, um, a.k.a. GQ Man of the Year. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> um, but look, you know, when I started off freelancing, first of all, um, I kind of thought, look, I'm just going to be really smart about this. I'm going to do it all myself. And of course, I realized that I hate doing this and I'm not not really very good at it either um so rather than spend time on something that I'm not good at and gives me no pleasure and takes away time from higher payoff activities I get a good accountant somebody who's going to actually ultimately give me the security and the peace of mind that everything is in order that nobody's going to be knocking at my door looking for a tax bill um, and actually might end up saving me money so um, if you need any advice on that send us a message privately or just drop us an email on your profile and we would be very happy to help you out in that regard Okay, and one of the final points that we'd say is that, look, there are certain things that are outside of your control and outside of all of our control in terms of energy crisis and, and, and so on. But there are ways in which you can start making savings now. We all have big bills coming in, and particularly as a, as a freelancer, you're going to have more bills coming in than that won't be covered uh, if you're part of a, of a company. Um, and again, there are a couple of, of things that some of you will be aware of and avail of, but for we're, we're hearing it more and more. People just weren't, aren't aware of some of the things that are available to them. So, for instance, with revenue, you can claw back some of the utility costs that you have if you're working most of your days uh, at home. So 30% of your electricity, heat and broadband costs for this year can be claimed back uh, from, from revenue when you do your tax submission. And for last year and the year before, it was 10% of electricity and heat and 30% of your of your broadband. So, again, it's free money. Uh, use, you know, if you're doing your own tax returns or using, you know, the the the, the facility of, of an accountant or whatever. Again, they should be able to advise you around the best way to claim for this. By the way, we'll have links to all of these later on that we'll we'll make available to you. So um, the other area, because energy, Jesus, it dominates the news at the moment. But despite all of that, and look, clearly energy costs are going to continue to rise to stupid levels. Um, but there are deals in place for just simply switching your business. Um, you know, 39%, 30% off, albeit higher costs, but there's still savings on, on if you don't switch. And most of these companies, as we all know, depend on inertia, people staying put without doing anything and not availing of the discounts, and they're there. The other areas that we have come across, and uh, we've available them ourselves when we were developing our own website, is that there's a two and a half K grant still available for through your local enterprise office if you're developing a website and it ideally for an e-commerce website. Now, some of you may say I'm not in the e-commerce game. All you have to do is put a booking form on your website as part of that. You are now e-commerce. You're providing an e-commerce facility to clients to book you or to liaise with you in some shape or form. This, again, is free money to help you develop a decent quality website. And again, there's a process through which you have to go through, but it's definitely worth doing. Uh, and that will continue from what we believe over the next couple of months as well. And the other part of that as well, for those of you who are working outside of Dublin, particularly where things like broadband and facilities may not be that great, or you just want to get out of the house and work as part of a community or part of your local community, there's all of these hubs, so the 240 plus hubs that the government have helped to try to fund over the course of the last 18 months, you can avail of up to three free days in those hubs. Um, now, there are other days that you have to pay for, and there's more sophisticated facilities that you have to pay for. But again, if you're in Leitrim or wherever the case may be, where you feel, look, I actually could do with getting out of the house and working amongst a, a community of other people, then you know, avail of those, those particular facilities as well. Uh, I think we're coming into the wrap-up, Una, because uh, yeah. we'll leave some time for discussion as well. 
Yeah, so I suppose the last thing that I would just say here is stay connected with us. Like, you know, our role is to help you earn, learn and connect. We'll obviously do our best to get you work, but we're also here to very much to be a sounding board and to help you kind of connect with each other. So just keep in touch with us. And Amanda puts on her events every week. So that's a great way to keep in touch with us as well. And we do have lots of information up on that website. So again, Chris, we mentioned Chris earlier on, but he's helped us develop and put up a lot of the resources, the LOL sessions that we've done, the content that we get. We have brilliant contributions from some of our freelancers. Um, Judy, I you know, is on the call today, but you know, articles and contributions like that are really, really valuable to the community at large. And the feedback that we get as a result of your experiences as a freelancer are really invaluable to other freelancers. So again, if any of you want to volunteer to contribute to a blog in any shape or form, by all means, let us know. Um, I'm going to wrap up. We have other resources there, like the free freelance book and so on, but we'll cover that off maybe later on. Um, again, look, hopefully the message that you've got from both myself and Una, given the negative, the level of negativity that's out there at the moment is just don't panic. You know, for those of you familiar, Dad, Dad's Army fan, fans back in the days but that message is really really important that it's important that people don't panic particularly when you're working on your own there's a couple of things that we would say that maybe encompass what we've already said but also just to reinforce them as well that you know there might be a downturn coming and certainly there, there's pressure going to rain down on people of all sorts over the next couple of months but try and minimize i'm certainly trying to do it minimize your exposure to Morning Ireland in the morning. Just take the first 10 minutes. If you're really into your radio news and so on, fine. But geez, don't get a full hour and a half of stuff that's going to bring down your day as you try to set off with some degree of positivity. Look after your physical and mental health. We know that energy, positive energy really matters, particularly to freelance and to creative people. It's essential for creativity, for innovation and productivity. And it really is important to us that you look after yourselves as well as individuals. Because look, if you're not well, then it's very hard to do the work that you're 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 equipped to do. As Una said, we've all been through the pandemic, you've been through recessions in a lot of cases as well, and this time will pass eventually. So you have to back yourself, you have to believe in yourself that you can get through this and that you have a really brilliant skill set that people are looking for and will pay for it as well. Set aside, as Una said, time to reevaluate your offering, your brand, your position in the market, uh, and the type of skills that you offer. And also, as I said, your pricing and get your finances in order so that you do maximize your savings. All of those things that I've just talked about energy bills and availing of the government grants and so on, things that will allow you just to minimize the, 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 the kind of costs that, that we're all going to be under, but also to allow you to trade through those slightly leaner weeks that might lie, lie ahead. And finally, that thing about staying close to us. Look, we're, we're not just here for potential jobs, uh, although clearly that, that's something that you're, most of you are interested in. But we're also here to provide some form of sounding board or an advice resource to you as well. And that's very much about why we set up the Indie List to, to try and do that. So look, guys, there's lots of web links. We're going to put this deck up online on our website in the next couple of hours. Um, and we'll send you a link to it if you like. But it'll be up there. And you can access all of the stuff that we've just talked about. Um, we're really open and we don't, haven't left much time for questions. But if people want to stay on, we'll stay on as long as you stay on. Uh, if you want to ask us any questions along the way, please do. Um, Amanda, you've uh, hopefully been taking some notes of any questions along the way. Do you want to? Uh, Hi, remember? everybody. There was a lot of um, compliments that went through. And thank you very much, Peter. And it was fabulous. The only one so far was Therese Wright. She said they love. She loved the idea of teaming up. Um, is it possible to get a list of other freelancers? But I see a lot of the freelancers have then replied back um, yeah. with your own email address. So I don't know how you want to handle that, Una and Peter. Uh, well, I don't think we can actually publish a list of um, freelancers that are on the platform from a GDPR point of view. That wouldn't be um, compliant. But I, I actually messaged Thrays directly when I saw her note coming through. And I think there's probably another way that we can kind of deal with that. So uh, Thrays um, has has actually already been in touch with us to discuss something similar around uh, pricing so we're we're going to we're going to try and do that and i see here on the messaging that there's like people sharing their linkedin profiles and um 
uh, these sessions are a great way for people to kind of try and connect in with each other, but we can take that offline and uh, discuss how we might do that effectively without breaching any GDPR guidelines.